The game starts with your castle under siege and you delivering your final speech to rally the... Hey, is this right? Oh, this is how the game starts? For real? Okay. Wait, did they do the... Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Yes, your grace, is a simulator of what it's like to be a manager without a clear job description. Someone's cow died? You better help. Villager lost his kid? Guess who needs to help? Local drunk can't afford shoes? Time to reach into the deep pocket of yours. Your subjects are never satisfied and on top of that you have three daughters, each with their own problems, a clearly depressed wife and zero time for yourself. Shout out to every married man in my audience, they finally made the game about us. Well, except for the king part. So, the game starts a year before the siege and you don't know who will be attacking you or for what reason. But you do know that something terrible will happen exactly one year from now. It's a nice mystery set up from the start that keeps you wondering what will go so horribly wrong in that year. But before all of this comes to be, you have a kingdom to run. You play as Eric. The king of a rather small kingdom of Davern, residing in your castle in the capital city of the country, Grevno. As king, you are responsible for keeping your subjects happy and fed and your treasury full of gold. If any of those metrics hit zero, the worst song to hear, if you are a monarch of a country full of angry villagers, will start playing. Each week your subjects will bring news and problems for you to solve. Mostly problems. Actually, it's only problems. But solutions are pretty straightforward. You can either help a subject or ignore them. Whatever you do, some of the resources will be used. Most rejected subjects will spread the word about how mean-spirited you are and overall happiness of the kingdom will decrease. Oh! Sadly, this is a fantasy world and making everyone's life worse has actual repercussions. So you can't cosplay the United States. If you decide to help, you will use the resources needed to solve the problem. And most of the time, you can instead send your agents to help. But you will lose access to them for several weeks in this case. And with challenges mounting on you, you will have to really think about whether or not you want to look into the problems of some village that worships a tree. You always have limited resources and the game makes you feel it. After you're done dealing with the subjects, you can walk around the castle and talk to your family. When the week ends, you are presented with a ledger of all the expenses in the kingdom and a few things you can upgrade with the spare resources you have. Do not neglect repairing the theater. At the start, the game is relatively easy. You have just a handful of people asking for your help and you can help everyone. But boy oh boy, this won't last long. Figured out how to deal with the ledger? Now you have to pay for each agent in your kingdom and you have to do it a week in advance without knowing if you will need them or not. Got used to talking to subjects? You now need to negotiate with the local lords for their help and resources. And they all either hate each other or just straight up use your weak position for their own benefit. We also have only one pigeon, so you will have to think hard about who you will call in this week. Can we breed more pigeons? No, our pigeon is a libertarian, so no other pigeon will talk to him. Figured all of that out? Now you need to send agents around the kingdom to solve problems in local villages. Oh, and did I mention that barbarian invasion is coming? Hope you're looking into it. It might sound messy, but all those mechanics are paced very neatly. First week is a walk in the park, but every week after, the gameplay gets progressively harder. Right to the point where you start questioning your own morals. The main idea of the game is a trolley problem on a scale of a kingdom. Who gets to eat? Do you care for soldiers or for peasants? Do you trade a prisoner of war for resources even if you know he will be killed in the most horrific way possible? Will you help refugees or let them die because they aren't your subjects? There will be many questions like that and even if you think you know the answer now, it might drastically change when you are one gold piece away from total collapse. By the way, the king of barbarians from the neighboring kingdom claims he was promised your firstborn daughter's hand and she just turned 14, so he can now press this claim. If you don't relent, their army will attack your kingdom very soon. The claim on your daughter's hand is real, but the promise was made under terrible circumstances. You and your wife Aurelia were attacked by a bandit. He demanded to have your future daughter's hand or he would kill your wife. So it's not like you willingly promised her to some random guy from the barbarian kingdom. He also asked the local witch to curse you so you won't break your promise. And this is a great time to talk about the art direction of the game and its setting. The world of Yes Your Grace is clearly inspired by Slavic folklore with babushkas, evil spirits, curses and witches. Yet the game doesn't clarify if magic and spirits actually exist. Most of the magical events that the locals claim happened could easily have normal explanations. Sure, the evil fog that consumes people sounds dangerous, but have you ever been to a swamp with fog over it? 
My Slavic grandmother had a few stories to tell about how our extended family got a little less extended because poor little Ivan got sucked in. Rest in peace, grandma. And, besides one magical event that contains spoilers, there is no clear and definitive answer to the question of the existence of magic. This adds an additional layer of mystery to the game. Maybe there are little magical goblins smashing the pots in the local village. Or maybe that old woman is just delusional. As for the art direction, it captures the Slavic look of the medieval fantasy land very well. But the game was clearly made on an indie budget, with that go-to style of all narrative-driven games that I like. Characters without faces, feet drawn like funny sausages, beautiful detailed backgrounds and music fitting the setting. This is Gods will be watching all over again, and that's a compliment. Great artistic choices all around. My only complaint is that we see very little of the world outside the castle. It's not really a problem, just my desire to get more of something I enjoyed. But, unlike the game, our future is not looking bright and colorful. The barbarian army is terrible news because we do not have our own army to fight them. There were no recent wars in the realm and everyone has been enjoying the peace for far too long. This is about to change on so many levels like you wouldn't believe. But, thankfully, there are other neighboring kingdoms with armies large enough to fight off the invasion. So you call upon one of the neighboring kings, Talis. He is a perfect example of a king. Harsh, unpleasant to talk to and genuinely an insanely obnoxious cunt. He has only a handful of lines during the beginning of the game and I already want him dead. His offer is as straightforward as a rod he has stuck up his kingly ass. Arrange a marriage between your daughter, Lord Sulea, and his son, Ivo. In exchange, he will give you 3000 warriors. More than enough to repel any attack from barbarians. Does he do it because he loves his son and wants him to be happily married? Of course not, he just wants his kid occupied with his new wife, so he won't bother him. You, of course, accept that deal. This deal will set off many events that will come later in the game. That decision, for all intents and purposes, kicks off the rest of the game. So I would like to share my thoughts on the main criticism most people have about the game. This is in fact the only criticism aside from the usual points which boil down to someone not vibing with the game. In this heavily narrative driven game, you have no say in this decision, and I have seen someone compare it to the way the story in Mass Effect is structured. It all comes down to a debate about freedom of choice in games. Why would you accept the deal with Talis? For some reason, there is no option to negotiate with the barbarians or ask another king to help. Or why not forge alliance with other lords and use their troops? And this and that and so on. And wow, this is a dumb thing to say. I understand where you're coming from, but I'm not going to respect you for being a dumb entitled gamer. The game never promised any branch in storytelling. You just made that up. I would like to have all those options, but I was cursed with the ability to read the store page before buying the game. You should give it a try too, by the way. Reading about the thing and thinking before deciding to do something is usually a great strategy for life. This is a low-budget project. You can tell that even if you never thought about the cost of making games. There's only a handful of backgrounds and sprites and the game screams at you that it's cheap. But you expect it to have branching storytelling with choices bordering on an immersive sim. Why can't you just jump into the air vent and backstab the king of barbarians? Oh, this game is certainly bad. You play as King Eric and he's an established character with his own set of desires and motivations. He's not going to talk with the King of Barbarians who just threatened to take his daughter by force. It's simply not on the list of things he would even consider. He's a father and he wouldn't give away his daughter to some rando who threatened him 14 years ago. If this is way too much for you to handle and you think the game is stupid, then sorry, you should not play narrative games. They are simply not for you. There are many other game genres you might enjoy instead. Your emotional reaction to what happens later in the game is absolutely normal, but if your only conclusion from it is getting angry and writing a bad review to demand something you were never promised, it's a you problem. But you do have limited freedom of choice in the game, and there is a lot of decisions that will influence the endings. To give you a vague idea of what it looks like, I chose the wrong dialogue option because I was too stubborn, and my advisor just straight up died. Here's his empty seat, and I have to live with that decision and look at it for the rest of the game. But the story still went in the same direction as before, because while I don't have an advisor to help me, I can just do 180 turn on my life and start acting like I never did in 40 years. I'm King Eric and King Eric don't negotiate with bandits, no matter if they are king or not. 
and your family members are written in the same manner. They are living human beings with their own wants and needs. I understand that this is a foreign concept for games, but your wife actually doesn't die to add emotional stakes for the story. I know, right? Having a main character interact with his wife and have a functioning family? Scandalous. Everyone in the family copes with the idea of the eldest daughter in the family getting married in their own way. Your wife, Aurelia, is worried about the future of your daughter, but also hopeful she will be happy in marriage, so she occupies herself with marriage preparations. Larsula, the eldest daughter who's getting married, gets madder and madder at you every week. She always been worried you would marry her off the moment she turned 13. And that's exactly what happened, so her anger is understandable. Asale, the middle daughter, is also trying to come to terms with the idea of turning 14 soon, and does so by being rebellious. She sneaks out of the castle to get drunk, fences with swords, rips her clothes and pierces her nose. All the usual teenage rebellion stuff. And Sedani, the youngest one of them all, got herself a pet snail, which she plans to have as a replacement for the cat Dusty, who's going away with Lorsulia. They will all change throughout the story and react in different ways to the terrible events that will happen, which is very refreshing to see. They aren't just background characters for you, the alpha male of the story, they are as important as you are. So it's a realistic family. Sorry for talking about it for so long, it's just so funny to me that writing a proper, functioning family is still such a rare and novel concept for games. Truly amazing what can be achieved when a studio is led by a woman and not another white as snow guy who can only think of the wife gone, sad trope as the main story element. I hope there will be more stories like that in games. And after you prepare everything for the wedding, everyone is happily celebrating Ivo and Lorsulia's union. The deal is sealed, Talis promises that the army of Kingdom of Atana will come to your aid and gives his final toast. And then he immediately dies from poisoning. This is where tutorial and the first hour of the game ends and the shit show begins. To avoid story spoilers, go to here. Okay, so I think they left. Holy shit, I hate Ivo. No redeeming qualities. He's taking second place in my chart of terrible young kings. But I'm getting ahead of myself. After the Talis' death, Ivo becomes the new king of Atana and refuses to help you. He withdrew all the funds his father was providing and any promises of military help, but he kept your daughter and took her away with him. Now you have to figure out who poisoned Talis and prove it in the royal trial. If you don't, you won't have any military help from Kingdom of Atana. Next week starts and you get first letter from Lorsula. She seems to be happy in her new home, but regrets spending her last weeks upset with her family. But it is what it is. Right now you need to focus on two things. Gathering evidence and finding out who poisoned Talis, and gathering enough of your own forces to fight off the invasion in case Ivo refuses to help. You have about 14 weeks left, and after that there's no turning back. Some of the more observant viewers can probably work out that the dates don't add up. The barbarian attack isn't going to happen a year after the start of the game, it will be sooner. And you are absolutely right, but you will have to wait. The investigation is pretty simple, you can look around the castle for clues and ask the lords if they know anything. You can also send your agents to gather information about the items you found. It's not too hard and you can find all the evidence pretty easily. You will manage it, you don't need levels of detective elegance ingenuity to solve it. As for the gathering forces, it's much more complicated. You have a long list of lords to ask for help, but most of them only care about their own problems. I won't go into details because every decision is another trolley problem. Sometimes they want you to marry off another daughter, sometimes they ask you to oust someone as a liar, and sometimes it's just a simple favor they need. There's also that guy who needs help with his drug empire, but let's not talk about him. That's all part of the main gameplay leading up to the big battle, so I don't see a point in spoiling every single decision to you. While we are preparing for the Law and Order special episode, there are a few things happening with the family before the royal trial. While you are busy with all of that, Asalia gets more and more rebellious. She made a new friend and it's a new strange girl living outside of the castle, Maya. She seems to know how to fight and use a bow, overall being too far from a typical lady. Asalia likes spending time with her, but after you put two and two together, you figure out that Maya is actually from Radovia, the kingdom of barbarians. So you, naturally, pull a Tony Soprano at them and pass out. <laughs> After you come back to your senses, Asalia explains that she really likes Maya and she's not as savage as you were led to think about Radovians. No matter what, she's not allowed to talk to Maya for now. Asalia gets extremely bored since she can talk to the only friend who understands her, but she has to comply for now. Sedani, the youngest one, is busy trying to recruit more animal agents for help. The last one she had was a snail, but she lost it at the wedding. 
She checked every corner of the castle, including the kitchen, to no avail. The snail is found dead during the wedding, mercilessly cooked in a stew. The next agent is a hedgehog, and he dies on the first mission because one of the petitioners sat on him. But she didn't give up and captured a fox. The poor thing was also killed, this time by a traveling hunter who thought it was dangerous and immediately disposed of it. Sedani is an amazingly relentless kid. She's already three dead agents behind and never stops looking for more. The reason for her behavior is different this time. She's training her agent animals to send them on a mission to bring her sister back, because she misses her. Your wife, being the loving and supporting woman that she is, gives you emotional support and also makes sure you have a potential heir to the throne. <laughs> it actually works out and your wife breaks the happy news to you. You are going to have another child. Everyone, of course, hopes it's a boy since there's no one to take over the kingdom right now. Meanwhile, Lord Sulia is sending you letters every now and then. She's happy and everything seems fine. Until the last letter, which is alarming. She says Ivan knows who poisoned his father and everyone in Atana is very agitated. But sadly, there's nothing else in the letter. After gathering all the evidence, we still don't know for sure who poisoned Talis. There are three main suspects, but things just don't add up. But at this point, you have to choose someone. Otherwise, there won't be any help from Ivo. You can refuse to decide who's responsible, but in that case, your advisor will lie and get himself killed, so you still have Atana's support. Right after the trial, you only have a few moments to talk to your daughter, but when you hug her, you notice bruises on her. This sick little fuck has been beating your daughter. And if you confront him, he threatens you to withdraw his forces, leaving you all to die. I'm going to kill this kid. I'm going to kill this kid the first chance I get. On the next day, the battle with Radovians begins. Everything goes smoothly until the fog obscures your vision. And after it disperses, there are twice as many enemies than you expected. Thankfully, you can just call on Iva's forces to help. Well, maybe they need some time, so you send in more forces and keep fighting to buy more time. Oh no, they have battle beasts. Yep, that's not looking good. We need some help. And then you get a letter saying help is not coming. So you are on your own now. It started out as a simple defense, but it turned into a desperate last stand. If you lose, everything is gone. Then, out of nowhere, an avalanche hits, burying all the forces under its weight. If it weren't for that, you and your family would have already been dead. But even if you survive, life is not getting any easier. Ivo just declared war on you, calling you a heretic who uses magic and blaming you for killing of his father. So you call on a king's council, but two of the neighboring kings have drastically different plans. One wants you to help any Radovian refugee you will come across, while the other agrees to help if you wipe out every last one of them. And the third one is a pedophile asking you for Asalia's hand. If you choose this option, I hope you watch that stupid flag at least sometimes. But even with their help, they will still need some time to get to your castle. So you will need to withstand the siege until reinforcements arrive. To do that, you need to have enough food stored to feed everyone during the siege, both soldiers and villagers. Prepare your castle for the siege by buying upgrades like reinforced walls and gates and make sure you have enough soldiers to defend the castle. This last bit is where all the decisions you made earlier come back to haunt you. Since you caused the death of every single soldier sent to you by the local lords, they won't be able to help you. So, you need to train the villagers to fight and they will only help you if you helped them in the past. Ignored the request of a local drunk? That's 20 fewer soldiers for you. And you need at least a hundred of them, but preferably 500. It's not like you need to help every villager, but you do feel the weight of every decision you made earlier in the game. And you can't really blame your subjects, because it was you who refused to help them in their darkest moment. And that little demon named Ivo is trying to do as much psychological damage to you as possible. First, he sends you a scarf made from the fur of a cat, revealing that he killed Dusty. Oh, and what did he do to your daughter? He burned her alive and wrote you a letter about it. This is so insane that first you lose consciousness and then you break into tears in front of your family.
I was not prepared to be hit with that emotional track. The writers did a great job, but I totally understand why some people were so upset with the lack of options for saving her that they went to write a negative review. This is a powerful and emotional storytelling, well done, no notes, but I hate you. Good job. While you are preparing for the siege, the rest of your family is not sitting idly either. Aurelia finds a witch who can make sure you will have a son. This is the only time when the game does something magical explicitly, and if you complete the ritual, you really get a son. But I don't know, maybe it was just a neat laser show. Answer inconclusive. Asalia, wanting to live a better and more fulfilling life, has two pieces of news to share. She's in love with Maya, and she wants to run away with her before the siege begins. I don't know what you would pick in this case, but she proved herself quite capable, and I'm not the one to stand in the way of true love. Good luck, Asalia. Stay safe. Oh, and Sedani has her final agent, a pet bear. Who cares at this point? She clearly plays in the hunter class, and she can handle it. With everything in place for the siege, it's time for the final battle against Ivo. How the siege goes depends on how well prepared you are and your previous choices. If you do everything poorly, the siege might end with your whole family dead. But if you succeed, you will have Ivo captured and entirely at your disposal. This poor excuse of a man even breaks the charade and confesses he was the one who poisoned his father. In fact, he tried to poison you, but by some miracle, you survived. Actually, it's not a miracle. Do you remember how Sedani was looking for her pet snail? She accidentally swapped goblets and the one meant for you ended up with Thales. And this damn goblin just kept lying non-stop about you being the killer. All the family pain and suffering was because of one stupid kid. You can decide to spare him, but it's not an option for me. He's getting hanged in every playthrough. Fuck him. And after that, you get ending slides for each important character in your story that reflect your choices. In the good ending, everyone is happy, your son is growing up strong, Asalia is writing your letters, and Sedani is still Sedani, just having fun. It's a nice and satisfying ending to the worst year of your life. Welcome back everyone who skipped story spoilers. Don't mind the people crying in the corner, they will get over it. It was a great story, a real shame that you missed it. You should try the game someday, it gets so bad, it's insane. Overall, Yes Your Grace is a great resource management game with a story that just punches you right in the nuts out of the blue. So, a great game overall. Solid 8 kids that should be beaten by their father out of one heroic snail. And if you feel like the game isn't long enough or the art direction could be more exquisite and solid, I have great news for you. The sequel is coming. I don't know when, but it's coming. I played the demo and it's a proper sequel. Everything is bigger, better and more dynamic. The tiring resource management minigame is now much more in depth, with you assigning agents and resources to meet demands. But now they synergize with each other. And you can even use the same agent multiple times for different missions. And there's a whole world to explore. And I don't even need to talk about the art direction, just look at it. <coughs> a winter theme, an amazing soundtrack, as always, and more locations to visit. And have you seen the trailer yet? We will surely get out of the castle more this time around. Oh, and your choices from the previous game carry over. And if you don't want to play it because you didn't skip story spoilers, it's okay, you can just answer a questionnaire. But the game won't let you choose the worst possible ending, and I'm absolutely okay with that. And the pet bear is here too. And a nice little dog. So please, play the original game and prepare to see how the story of Eric and his family continues in the sequel. If you liked the video, consider joining our royal family of subscribers. It means the world to me. More videos to come, love and kisses, b After seeing how the game handles the family story, I got increasingly pissed off at the big budget projects that seem unable to write a good story about it. If you know of any other games that treat family of protagonists as actual living humans, please tell me about them in the comments, I'm craving for more of those. Developers have a Discord server, where they gather feedback on demos and stuff like this. Please join it and help break the insane chain of people posting hmm in the off-topic channel. Also, there is a review of Felvidek you might enjoy. It's also about medieval fantasy land. It was released I don't know how long ago, but I didn't press the button that lets you know that there is a new video. So please check it if you missed it. No! Caputo! Rock. What the f*** is a Caputo?